Thank you for watching. Subscribe to Revenge Story Times for more stories. Last night, I treated my wife, Anna, like a queen. We've been going through a rough patch lately, and this seemed the perfect time to set things right. I took the day off work, ostensibly to take our two kids, Jake, 14, and Lily, 12, to a week-long soccer camp, but mostly to make sure everything was perfect. I started by sending two dozen long-stem red roses to Anna at her work. I wrote the note myself, roses are red, my love for you true, my plans for tonight will make it clearer to you. Dinner's on me, dessert is just you, seconds and thirds guaranteed. Yeah, I know, not exactly Shakespeare, but I figured it would do the trick. I was right. I got a very passionate kiss at the front door, plus a report on how jealous her co-workers were. Anna fixed me with a lusty gaze. Lucky doesn't begin to describe the night you're going to have. I took charge immediately and corrected her, this night is all about you. Step 2 was to draw my love a steamy bubble bath, complete with a glass of perfectly chilled Chardonnay. I told her to take her time while I got dinner ready, not that I was cooking. I simply drove to her favorite Italian place and picked up dinner for two. I popped it into the oven upon my return. I had just finished setting the table when I heard Anna behind me, you are a naughty, naughty boy. I turned to see a vision in red, Anna was wearing everything I bought today, the bra and panty set, the garter, stockings, and the shoes, the red stilettos that screamed screw me. She had no idea just how naughty I planned on being. Dinner and lots of wine later, I led her to our bedroom. She followed willingly as I slowly undressed her along the way, laying her on the bed. I rained kisses all over her body. I kissed her neck and made her squirm beneath me. Basically, I tortured her with foreplay, constantly moving around her body. As soon as she got really into whatever I was doing, I took her through a second and then a third round before we screamed our simultaneous orgasms. We rested for a few minutes, saying those words that lovers say. Actually, I was doing most of the talking, she was somewhat incoherent. I told her again and again how much I loved her. I crawled into bed next to her and fell immediately asleep. I slept very soundly. Awakening early the next morning, I showered and was out the door before she knew it. I left a note reminding her that I would have to work late to make up for taking the day off. Before, oh, I definitely had my work cut out for me. Today, I, Mark Thompson, am sitting in ambush for a 304. I check my watch, any minute now, the 304 would be my wife of 16 years, Anna, the aforementioned queen of last night's amorous activities. Anna has been cheating on me for, well, as near as I can determine, the better part of a year. I've been sure for the last month, suspicious for two before that. My suspicions were based on the little things that flow back and forth between couples, the behaviors, the habits, and most importantly, the easy evasions that hint something's not quite right here. For instance, there were lots of little things that by themselves were all innocently explained, things like our sex life being way down, while Anna dressing sexy was way up. She was feeling it, I sure as hell wasn't getting it. I know, I know, that's not much to go on. One of the primary instances that caught my attention and coalesced my observations into suspicions was a night out without the kids. Anna met me at the restaurant, having come directly from work. Come turned out to be the operative word because Anna had the unmistakable blow of someone who just had really good sex. It was in her eyes, her face, and particularly in the way she moved. That night, when I should have gotten lucky, she begged off sex, citing a mild yeast infection. I settled for a hand job and decided to find out the truth. So, I started checking up on her, monitoring her time away from me, checking the laundry, and listening very, very carefully to everything she said. It's amazing the things you pick up in common conversations when you really pay attention. I've always operated on the idea that a woman will do everything she can to avoid an outright lie. This doesn't mean you'll get the truth, it means you have to really listen and consider all of the possible meanings of the words being spoken, almost as if you were playing verbal chess. So many possibilities and permutations. I was surprised at the subtle insinuation of disrespect that permeated our interactions. There was an undeniable condescension. I seem to have lost my former position in the hierarchy and equality of our relationship. That, and it was difficult to get a hold of her at work on Wednesday and Friday afternoons, even though, in my mind, my suspicions had turned to certainty. 
There was nothing worth going to see a lawyer about. Then I found what I needed, actual physical evidence, a pair of crusted, black, sheer panties. I knew the last time I had seen her wearing these panties. I knew to the day the last time we had sex. The discrepancies between these two dates added up to infidelity, as far as I was concerned. At that point, she was more likely guilty than innocent. Confronting Anna was a little more problematic. I mean, she'd been lying to me for who knows how long. I assumed that she had her cheating excused by some form of perverted rationalization. I decided on a simple, straightforward approach. I suggested another husband and wife only night out, reminding her that she owed me. I asked her specifically to wear the black sheer panties that night. As we dressed, I reminded her about the panties, and she said I wouldn't be disappointed. Dinner was fine, as I generously poured on the attention and the wine. By the time we got home, Anna was as horny as I'd seen her in years. Strip for me, I said as I lay back against the headboard, hands behind my head. Come on, you sexy things, show me what you got. Anna began to sway drunkenly but shook her head. Anna, you owe me. We haven't had sex in almost a month. Actually, it was just two and a half weeks, but I wanted her to say that. I waggled my finger at her. We had sex the day you went on that trip. It's only been, she paused, two weeks, two and a half weeks, fine, two and a half weeks. One fact agreed to. Come on, you sexy thing, take it off. Okay, but don't expect this every time you take me out. I nodded my head as Anna slowly disrobed. She unzipped her skirt, bent over, and hooked her thumbs in the material. Hey, who's doing the striptease anyway? She was trying to joke, but I heard the hard edge beneath her tone. Hey, I thought this was about pleasing me. I want to see those. What's the big deal with those, Mark? Come on, I'm horny, you're horny. I gave you those as an anniversary gift last year. Remember, they symbolize our marriage, our intimate bond. Come on, humor me. Drop the skirt and let me see those panties. I couldn't find them, Mark, she said, furious with me. They're probably in the wash. You always wash your lingerie together. You have the bra, where are the panties? I was not about to let this go. I told you I couldn't find them. She was getting pissed, and I just got calmer and calmer. Hey, don't get mad at me. I'm just the guy who gave them to you and asked you to wear them for him. I shrugged in innocence. All you had to do was say something earlier. I wouldn't have insisted if you had told me the truth. All you had to do was be truthful. What's so hard about that? So, the last time you wore them was right before my trip. I remember because you looked so sexy in them when we were getting ready for bed. You took them off, hey, maybe they got kicked under the bed. Look, Mark, can we just forget about the damn panties right now? The horniness was draining from her face. I could see a glimmer of doubt in her eyes. Can't you just make love to me? Sure, no problem, I said, and a sigh of relief. I wasn't done with her yet. I think I remember where I bought those. Man, they really meant a lot to me. Yes, Mark, her voice was edged with weariness. I can see that. She stepped back from the bed, her desire clearly ebbing. The last time I saw you with them on was right here in this room. I rolled off the bed and knelt beside it, lifting the sham. You took them off before we had sex, right? I think you were standing right about here. Remember? I remember, Mark. I was standing here. I took them off, and we had sex, but now I'm standing here, I'm not wearing them, and I seem to be developing a headache. I think I will give you a rain check on the rest of the evening, and Anna began to pick up her clothes. Well, what's the problem? They're just panties, no big deal, I said. Anna looked miserable. Are we okay, Anna? Is there something you want to tell me? I mean, it's been two and a half weeks since we had sex, and I make a simple request, and now I'm in the doghouse. Why didn't you just tell me that you didn't know where the panties were? What's so hard about being honest with me? I don't know. I didn't want to disappoint you. I know it's been a while since we've been together. 
we're both so busy with careers and family. I guess I've turned next to nothing into a big to-do. I am sorry, she replied. Me too, I said. Well, how about we reschedule? As I said this, I smiled as I pulled out the crusty underwear and extended them to her. She took them, looking puzzled, momentarily horrified, then surprisingly confident. So that's where they've been. I thought I'd look there, she recovered very quickly. Go ahead, put them on. They're filthy, Mark. I'll make sure you're the first to see them after I wash them. That's it. I had to admire her brazenness. Why is there something else? We haven't had sex in two and a half weeks. We agreed. The last time you wore these, you took them off before we had sex. Explain to me what they're all crusty with, I silently congratulated myself on not sounding accusatory. It looks like a load. What happened next was a bravura performance of lies and evasions. We were wrong on the dates and timings of when we'd had sex. She even made a big deal over realizing that I suspected her of seeing someone else. I was jealous over nothing, she thought it was cute that I suspected her of being a crazed vixen. I apologized profusely for my jealousy and poor memory. I watched the look of conquest glow from her. I'm sure she thought everything was alright. It wasn't alright, she was wrong. It wasn't nothing, and there is nothing cute about being a 304. I knew that much. My apologies dissolved into a white-hot quiet anger. My anger ushered in a change of perspective. I was no longer in doubt, I knew then that she was screwing someone else. As far as I was concerned, our marriage was over. I knew, and soon she would know that I knew. When you're no longer in denial, you can actually find out a lot in a very short amount of time. I wanted incontrovertible evidence, basically wanted to catch her in the act, and I was willing to do whatever it took. It's amazing what they can do with modern GPS equipment, a tap on your own phones, a bit of computer snooping, and a couple of digital voice recorders. All too soon, I had a fairly clear picture of who he was, what they did, how often, and most importantly, when they planned to meet next. Her lover was some guy named Tom, they met two to three times per week, Wednesday, Friday, and frequently Saturday, usually at a hotel on the other side of town. It all seems so routine when you listen to the recordings. The biggest surprise for me was the complete lack of guilt on Anna's part. In the tape conversations, I was usually characterized as simply someone to be scheduled around. That was it. I was a complication to their being together. When I realized Anna's utter lack of concern and the depth of her disrespect for me, I went from some ambiguous thoughts of possible reconciliation with her really having to make it up to me, to absolute retribution. She was going to pay. I wasn't going to fight for her, she was now the enemy. I was going to fight her for everything. It's amazing what that kind of clarity can do for you. I can even tell you the exact moment that I reached that tipping point. It occurred in the hearing of her side of a single conversation, shortly after the panty incident, a voice recorder in her car got this side of a cell phone conversation between Anna and Loverboy. Anna? Suspicious? Not anymore. Mark trusts me completely. You should see him go out of his way to be nice to me. It really is quite cute. Anna, I just explained that the crusty scene in the dirty underwear he'd found was his. I said that I had been looking for weeks for those panties. I thanked him for finding them underneath the washer. He bought it without a second thought. Anna, yeah, but has my dumb man. Anna, yeah, I do adore it. Be patient, I'm almost there. Anna, no, Tom, I've told you before. I love Mark as my husband. Anna, yes, I love you too, but in a different way. Thank God I don't have to choose. I have the best of both worlds, a husband who makes love to me and a lover who totally screws me. It's funny, the things you can consider when you no longer care about the other person. The witch was going to pay, big time. Playing the cards you're dealt, my payback was multi-pronged. I wanted Anna to suffer, short-term and long-term. If things went as planned, Anna would never forget her cheating. I can't say I was looking to put a hurt on Tom, as far as I was concerned, he was just an opportunistic prick. If trouble came his way, so be it. 
Our kids were a different story. I wanted to protect them from the initial blast of our family dissolving, plus I wanted it all to land on Anna. I wanted her to look into their sad faces and know that she alone was responsible. In that way, they actually determined my timing. I waited for the school year to end and arranged for them to attend a week-long soccer camp at a university a couple of hours drive away. The camp ran Monday through Friday. I dropped the kids off Monday morning and took the time to talk with the camp directors. I explained that I was having serious problems with their mother involving faithfulness and possible drug use. I tossed that in for effect, it definitely got their attention. I told them I'd be filing for divorce today or tomorrow, depending on when she dragged herself home. I wanted to shield the kids during the initial days of anguish. The directors were very sympathetic. Today, Tuesday, was the day of reckoning, and it was scheduled to meet Tom at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I spent that day getting all my ducks in a row, divorce papers ready, locks changed, bank accounts, and credit cards taken care of. This was a day Anna would never forget. I checked my watch again, timing was all important. I smiled when I saw her car enter the parking lot, Operation Slap the 304 down was now operational. I called Anna's work as soon as I saw her car turning into the parking lot. I left a quick message on her voicemail, saying there was an emergency and to call me on my cell phone as soon as possible. Tom arrived a few minutes later. Damn, he was young, mid to late twenties by my guess. Any remaining trepidations about my intended course of action vanished when I saw Anna enthusiastically kiss Tom. I called her cell phone while she was still kissing him. She looked at her phone and did what I thought she would, she let it ring. I hung up at the start of her voicemail and called again. I figured she would either turn her phone off or lock it in her car. That way, she had plausible deniability if I was to ask her later why she didn't answer. She chose option number two and locked the phone in her car. That's when I left a message that said there was a family emergency and that she needed to call me as soon as she could. I watched them enter the room and began to call and hang up every couple of minutes. I planned on leaving dozens of missed call flags on her phone. I waited about 20 minutes, figuring they were at the very least naked, if not having sex, then drove to a spot next to Anna's car. I opened my trunk, fest to look natural in case anyone was looking in my direction. All they would see is some guy with the trunk of his car open. Did you know you can unscrew the inner part of a tire valve stem, and the air rushes out in no time at all? In less than three minutes, I flattened both tires on the driver's side of Anna's car and screwed the inner valves back into place. I took half a dozen roofing nails that I had shortened to about one inch in length and pushed them into the thick portion of the tire tread. It looked as if she'd run over a bunch of nails. Tough luck. Tom's truck received some special treatment. Okay, I wasn't looking to physically hurt Tom, but since I had the opportunity, I decided to screw with him too. I had borrowed a small floor jack, so I jacked up the front of his car and loosened the oil pan bolt until it was just holding on. I lowered his car, put the jack in my trunk, and closed it. I was finished with everything in 15 minutes. I drove off and waited for them to finish. They came out of the room two hours later with more kissing and hugging. The only noticeable difference was that Anna's movements were more languid and affectionate. She gets that way after sex. Her movements were anything but languid when she saw the two flat tires. She was gesturing and waving her arms around as she walked front to back alongside her car. Tom must have said something stupid because she turned and said something that had him putting his hands up in front of him as he shook his head and backed away. Idiot. I called her phone. She looked in the car and fished around in her purse for her car key. I swear you could see her flinch when she saw the number of missed calls. It was showtime. I saw her dial and prepared myself for my performance. Hello, Mark. Have you, her voice sounded shaky and nervous. My God, Anna, where have you been? I was yelling into the phone. I paused to take a breath. You don't have to yell, Mark. I can hear you just fine. I've been trying for hours to get a hold of you. Where are you? Why aren't you at work? I had my voice pitched right at the edge of panic. Anna started to stammer around some lame excuse. I started talking over her. 
I began to crinkle some paper and break up my speech pattern. Be quiet and listen. There's been a serious accident at the soccer camp. Both kids have been taken to the hospital. I'm on my way there now. They're in emergency surgery. The doctors aren't sure if they'll make it. Hurry, my battery's dying. Did you get that? Medical center. I'll meet you there. Hurry. I hung up and turned off my phone. I could see her shouting into the phone, then she swung into action. Anna pushed Tom to his car, and soon they were heading for the freeway. I waited until they were out of sight, then drove to Anna's car. I pulled the phony nails out of her tires and refilled them both with cans of flat fix. She was going to need her car before the end of the day. I had two more calls to make before I drove home. I headed for the freeway they would be taking to get to the university. I stopped at the first emergency call box on the freeway and pulled out two of my voice recorders. I was soon talking to the state highway patrol. I pitched my voice low and added a southern drawl. Hi, officer, I want to report a case of road rage, I guess you'd call it. I was going to speed limit, I said that with emphasis, and this blue Ford pickup just came flying up behind me, right on my bumper. Excuse my language, officer. I should have pulled over, but well, anyway, this crazy guy starts leaning on his horn, then he swings out around me, and surprise, he didn't hit anyone, and swerves up right next to me, almost hit me. Bad as that was, I mean, I have my wife and kids with me, then he sped up and cut right in front of me. I got a partial plate, just the last three numbers, 847. My name is, I pressed the recorder, and an angry female voice blared out of the speaker. Tell them about the gun, Harold. I saw a gun, that crazy a-hole flashed a gun at you. I turned away from the phone. Honey, I didn't see it. Look, I'm just telling them. I pressed the second recorder, so those crazy people can track us down and kill us. Hang up, Harold, hang up right now, like this, Harold. I disconnected the call. I'd recorded those phrases with a woman at work who had a booming southern drawl. I told her it was for a practical joke on my shiftless brother-in-law. She'd given me half a dozen takes without batting an eye. I got back in my car and headed home. On the way, I called the soccer camp people, and in a world-weary voice, I informed them that telling my wife I was divorcing her had not gone well. I told them that she had gone ballistic and threatened my life. I warned them that she and her lover might be on the way there to try and take the children. I told them I was just calling to be certain that they wouldn't release the children to them as my wife's lover was a known drug user, and it wasn't a safe situation for the kids. The camp operators were very understanding. I asked them not to say anything to the kids unless it was absolutely necessary. An hour or so later, I was sitting at home, eating pizza and drinking beer. I figured I had at least one more hour before Anna might show up. That would be the case if she was able to contact the soccer camp and determine that the kids were fine. I didn't think that likely, as I had made all the arrangements, and she didn't even have the proper name for the camp, let alone the phone number. If she got to the university, she would then find out that there wasn't a university medical center or hospital. If she got there, I had to smile at that. If the oil drain plug had fallen out, she and Tom were sitting by the side of the road. A couple of hours later, the camp called to report that Anna and a male companion had indeed shown up. They arrived in the company of the state police. The police had pulled them over for speeding and just about strip-searched them, looking for weapons, something about a report of road rage. The camp officials assured her that the kids were fine, but that they had refused to let Anna see them unless it was in the presence of their father. She asked them what the hell is that supposed to mean? That's when one of the camp people mentioned the impending divorce and asked if the man she was with was her husband or her lover. They said Anna went white as a sheep, then she became hysterical. The state police had to escort Anna and Tom off the campus grounds. Then the soccer camp folks made my day. While Anna and Tom were talking, one of the staff mentioned the drug user reference to the police. They pulled Tom over just after they left the campus and searched him again. Evidently, Tom got pissed and got into it with one of the officers. They arrested him for driving while impaired. Anna was deemed unfit to drive due to her hysterical emotional state and was taken into temporary custody too. 
I received a call from the state police not long after speaking with the camp folks. I had a very nice conversation with a Sergeant Watson. I explained that my wife had been cheating on me and that I'd finally had enough. Anna was informed this afternoon that I had seen a lawyer and had filed for divorce. I gave the sergeant my lawyer's telephone number. The sergeant asked if I had stayed available as he wanted to talk to my wife. I said sure, but don't be surprised if she denies everything. I even suggested it was okay with me if they wanted to take a vaginal swab. He declined. A half hour later, he called back, they were releasing Anna, and that my wife wanted to talk with me. I told the sergeant that she was free to call my lawyer at the number I had provided. He kind of laughed a little when he asked if I was coming to pick Anna up. I informed them that her car was in the parking lot of the motel where she'd been screwing her lover. He chuckled a little at that. Ten minutes later, the phone rang, and I saw Anna's cell number on the caller ID. I picked up and said nothing. Finally, after a long pause, I heard an inhalation and Anna's quavering voice. Mark, I don't know what you think is going on, but please don't make this any worse than you already have. Your adultery has destroyed our family, you stupid 304. I hung up and turned the ringer off. I would have loved to see her face when she heard the new answering message on the machine. Hi, this is Mark. Anna no longer lives here. Her cell number is. It was 2 in the morning when I heard someone pounding on the front door. I walked to the door and shouted through it, your things are in the driveway. I'd packed, okay, stuffed her clothes into a bunch of trash bags. Take your cheating bum and go away. Mark, please let me in, Anna sounded absolutely exhausted. There's been a terrible misunderstanding. We need to talk. I love you, Mark, please. We went back and forth. I didn't budge. Finally, I replayed part of a phone conversation I taped when she was driving in her car. She was talking to Tom and saying how much she loved having sex with him. I turned the volume up loud when it came to the part of their sex conversation. Anna started to cry. I told her to get her stuff and go, stay with her lover, or whoever else she was screwing. She finally left, telling me that she was going to wear parents and would be back tomorrow to straighten this all out. The next day didn't quite work out the way she intended. Actually, none of the days that followed worked out for her. I was as relentless as I was unmerciful. I had her officially served at work on Thursday. That little stunt had her waiting by my car at the end of the workday. She was furious. I have nothing to say to you, 304. I was quite pleased with my ability to remain calm. Don't you dare talk to me that way. I can't believe you had me served at work. Do you have any idea what you've done, she was as angry as I've ever seen? What I've done? I'll talk to you however I choose. Would you prefer stupid 304? Mark, I admit that I may have made a mistake. We can work through this. I love you, Mark. Let's stop this silliness. Silliness? You're a cheating, stupid 304. If I give you 20 bucks, will you go away? How dare you? I am your wife, Mark. I am the mother of our children. Now, they're going to be coming home tomorrow, and they're going to find just me. I imagine you, the stupid 304, will be on your back somewhere with lover boy. Mark, please stop calling me names. It's not going to help us. We need to talk about this. I realize you're angry and upset, but we can work through this, Mark. Our marriage can be stronger for this. Would you listen to yourself, you stupid 304? Stop calling me names, Mark. Okay, answer me this. I glared at her with an intensity of hatred that surprised even me. She wilted before me. You chose to be with another man. You stripped naked before him. You gave him an Aussie kiss and let him screw you. By doing this, you risk everything. Our marriage, our family, my love and respect for you, my health. By the way, dearest, I've been tested, and I'm clean, so far. HIV testing is a six-month wait. She paled at that comment. You risk everything. What did lover boy risk? 
No, no, it's not like that, Mark. You risk everything, he risked nothing. What did you get? Tell me what you got. You're about to lose everything, Anna. What did you get from your lover? What did you get for throwing all of this away? She just shook her head, unable to speak. That's exactly right. You got nothing. No jewelry, no trips to romantic locales, no cars, nothing. No secret bank account, no suitcase full of money, not one damn thing did you get. You got nothing. Well, you're right about one thing. I have absolutely no right to call you a stupid 304. A 304 is smart enough to get something for sex. You screwed another man for which you got nothing, and now you're going to lose everything. You're not even smart enough to be a decent 304. Calling you a 304 is giving 304s a bad name. I guess that just makes you a really dumb 304. I drove away with her sitting on the ground, sobbing uncontrollably. Screw her. Cashing in my chips, I arrived for the lawyer's office right on time. I had even stopped by the house to shower and dress in a suit. I wanted her to see me at my best. I sat opposite her in the lawyer's office. If I cared for her in any way, the look that Anna leveled at me should have wrung my heart out. Her pain was palpable. My expression remained calm and impassive, my resolve was unwavering. She made one last effort to put off the inevitable. I simply glanced down at my watch, then back up at Anna. Her shoulders slumped. She picked up the pen and asked my lawyer where to sign. Victory was mine. I felt like I wanted to do some silly endzone dance. The first document she signed was the petition for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. At one time, I had cared deeply that the cause be listed as adultery. I was fortunate to have a lawyer who really knew how to bring on the pain. The key, she had told me again and again, was in the terms and conditions of the divorce. Success was determined by knowing what the other side wanted and what you could force them to give up in return. The whole signing process was literally a performance my lawyer and I had choreographed. There were props and characters. It was really quite impressive. The next document was a name change request. Anna was being required to revert back to her maiden name. If you don't think that's a big deal, guess again. She was no longer going to have the same last name as her children. That point alone almost sank the agreement. Oh yeah, that one hurt big time. I watched as Anna relinquished my surname, tears trickling down her cheeks. A small black tray was placed before her. This time, when Anna looked at me, her expression seemed hollowed out. Then it hit me, and I actually felt a twinge of sympathy for her. It wasn't just that any hope of avoiding this was failing, it was more than that. The realization of loss was being overwhelmed by the actual reality of surrender. Her losses were suddenly real. These were not negotiating points any longer. She looked at the tray and shuddered as she removed her wedding ring. As soon as she placed it on the tray, it was quickly removed from the room. She twisted her engagement ring on her finger. I had let her keep it, but even that small victory was about to turn to ashes. Do you know why I'm letting you keep that ring, Anna? I gave you that ring when I asked you to be my wife. I want you to keep that ring to remember all that we promised and all that you've thrown away. I pulled my wedding band off my finger and pushed it toward her. You can have this back, it's still whole and complete. I kept my promises. One of my lawyer's assistants returned with the tray. Anna's ring had been cut in two. I picked up the pieces and held them in my open hand, then tossed the pieces into a trash can. Worthless crap. Anna seemed to waver in her chair and reached out to grip the table, her head bobbing slightly. My thrill of victory was beginning to fade. I actually began to feel sorry for her as the next document was placed before her, a quitclaim deed for her share of the house. The key here was that the monetary value of her share was being put in a college trust for the children, with her as trustee until they came of age. Finally, we came to the document that had leveraged her acceptance of everything that had preceded it, the custody agreement. My lawyer spoke clearly, do you fully understand the conditions of this custody agreement? The children remain in the house, 
parents alternate living in the house on a weekly basis. The transition of custody to occur every Sunday between the hours of 6 o'clock and 7 p.m. All expenses to be borne equally until the children finish college or reach the age of maturity. If you agree to these conditions and arrangements, just sign at the bottom. I watched my soon-to-be ex-wife sign. The pen fell listlessly from her hand, and she began to cry in earnest. Defeat is not a pretty sight, and it lasts a long, long time. I had been a step ahead of Anna from the moment she exited that motel room with Tom. My position was unchanging, divorce and controlling custody of the kids. I guess she thought she could find a way around all this. I had a couple of things going for me, the kids, of course, were the key. I'd bent over backward to protect them and ensure that Anna and her parents had access to them. I also promised not to tell the kids what their mother had done that led to our divorce. That was couched in the language of your mom and dad are parting as partners, but not as parents. The other key was the threat of revealing and releasing video evidence of Anna and Tom. Although truth be told, I really didn't have any. Years before, a friend told me that he'd seen an adult movie starring an actress who bore a striking resemblance to Anna. I checked it out and had to admit that there was a real resemblance. During the planning phase of my retribution, I turned that resemblance to my advantage by buying a number of those movies. I found a couple of videos with actors that matched a verbal description of Tom, late 20s, average height and weight, dark hair, etc. By taping portions of the videos off the TV with my camcorder, I was able to produce a pretty graphic motel room session. It looked like video shot under poor lighting conditions. It was especially effective when viewed on the 2.5-inch LCD screen of the camera. It looked like Anna being screwed by Tom. Anna would have spotted it as a fake in a second, but not her dad. We had a meeting where he tried to convince me to give Anna another chance. He said that he was willing to pay a lawyer to keep the divorce from happening. So, I showed the video to her dad. I told him this was one of the easier ones to view and that I had hours of the stuff. Evidently, he was very effective in persuading Anna to drop her opposition. I guess I would be too if an irate son-in-law was threatening to email the video to everyone and anyone they knew, family, friends, co-workers, etc. The clincher, when all was said and signed, was the joint custody, alternating weeks. I made sure that there was specific and clear language in the agreement that Anna was prohibited from bringing her lovers, I insisted that the plural be used, into the house. You know what's funny? The last thing I expected when getting divorced was the effect it seemed to have on women. I'd be lying if I didn't say that my own self-esteem had taken a huge hit after being cut by Anna. You can't help but feel you're not much of a man, at the very least, you must be a lousy lover. I was shocked to find out that my new marital status, or lack thereof, was like catnip to women. During the divorce, I had stubbornly taken the high ground regarding revenge, sex, or even dating, for that matter. That just wasn't who I was. Plus, my lawyer insisted on no additional complications. But as an officially single man, with good credit and plenty of disposable income, suddenly, I was a catch. And you want to know what was even better? There were a lot of women out there determined to see me through this difficult time. I was pleasantly surprised at the number of women willing to help me get back in the saddle, so to speak. They were so persistent that I began to look forward to my time living at home with the kids. I needed the rest. I had offers from women at work, from acquaintances, including some who were good friends with Anna, and even from fellow residents of my new apartment building, where I stayed during my off weeks. This is how the first time happened while I was still moving into my new place. I'd ordered pizza, so the soft knock indicating its arrival wasn't unexpected. The delivery person sure was. I recognized her as someone I'd seen in the building. I didn't know her name. Hi, my name is Brenda, she pronounced it Brenda, with a drawl, and I'd just like to welcome you to the building. Brenda was average looking and had an easy to like quality about her. I invited her in, and we shared the pizza and a couple of beers. Brenda was divorced. He tried to screw everything female over 18, and some under, I suspect, she explained. Ample, plumpish, and refreshingly straightforward. Mark, I like you. You seem like a real nice guy, so anytime you need the company of a woman, you just call old Brenda. I nodded, unknowingly. 
I almost started to say that I could handle the cooking and cleaning just fine as a freshly single guy. I was really clueless. I love kisses, both the giving and the getting. Screwing only happens after a date. Brenda had spoken so clearly and matter-of-factly that I wasn't even erect. Now, now, let's see that of yours. Yeah, well, alright, Mark, you got a good one here. Lucky me. It was without a doubt the weirdest proposition I had ever received. It was followed by one truly excellent kiss. There's just something to be said for a woman who truly enjoys giving kisses. I realized that Brenda was such a woman. Lucky me. It wasn't just her enthusiasm, it was her technique, too. I can't begin to describe what she was doing, mostly because my head was tilted back in an unrestrained ecstasy. The next night, the kiss was repeated, followed by my going down on her. By the end of the night, we were having sex. I'd managed to convince her that the pizza dinner we'd shared the night before counted as being a date. We started having sex frequently, not that we were exclusive, far from it. A couple of weeks after we'd taken up, Brenda had to go out of town on business during one of my off weeks, so she sent a friend over. Rhonda wasn't into kisses near as much as Brenda, but oh god, could that woman screw. I have to admit that I was a bit of a 304 at first. Well, it's probably more accurate to state that I screwed and was screwed by 17 different women during the first year of my divorce. The sex was great, if a little empty. I freely admit that I missed the intimacy that Anna and I had once had. On the other hand, that missing only fueled my continuing anger toward her. I made no effort to hide my amorous activities from her. I enjoyed seeing that hurt in her eyes every Sunday evening. Slowly, things settled into a routine. Even the kids seemed to be doing okay. Holidays were painful, especially the first time through, but we managed. Months became years, and we all got older, if not wiser. It was four years post-divorce that the unexpected happened. I fell in love. Laying down your cards, the kids were involved in a youth group at church. The group went on all kinds of outings, including a couple of snow weekends in winter. I was asked to chaperone on occasion and was more than happy to help out. It was during a ski trip that Jillian, one of the other chaperones, she was the sister of one of the youth ministers, broke her arm. After first aid was rendered by the ski patrol, I was asked to run her down the hill to get it x-rayed and put in a cast at the hospital. Once we got there, it was swamped due to a traffic accident, and we ended up going across the street to eat and kill a couple of hours. Jillian was cute, rather than beautiful, and all of 25. As we talked and ate, I became aware that we had real chemistry between us. I found myself deeply attracted to Jillian. She did nothing to dissuade me. It took me a month to summon the courage to ask her out on an official date. After all, I was 21 years her senior. She accepted. She told me her dad was 12 years older than her mom, and they were still together, and we began to date. I slowly let go of my harem over the next few weeks as Jillian and I got serious. Everything was happening fairly fast. Jillian and I were a couple of months into our relationship, yet that's what it was when Anna asked if I was in love with Jillian. I was all prepared to deny it when I realized I couldn't lie about something like that. I answered with a quiet yes, and Anna just nodded and then hugged me. You deserve to be happy. I was stunned. 1. That I realized that I really did love Jillian. 2. That Anna sensed and accepted it. And 3. When I told this to Jillian, she simply smiled and said it had taken me long enough. For the first time in years, I realized that I was truly happy. I was actually content within myself. That was when I understood that there was something very important that I needed to do. I had accepted Anna's apology for her unfaithfulness years ago, but at the time, I refused to forgive her. It was time for me to formally forgive Anna, so I could move forward. You should have seen the tears that Sunday night. Anna, me, the kids, we were all bawling our eyes out. Some tears were tears of sorrow and regret, most were happy tears. I told Anna that despite it all, there was a part of me that would always love her. She said that she had never stopped loving me. I nodded in understanding. Nothing is forever. That's always a tough one to learn. I loved Jillian, and she loved me.
We were happy in our relationship, but both of us acknowledged that marriage was not in our future. For one thing, Jillian wanted kids, and I had a vasectomy just after Lily was born and was unwilling to consider reversal. Needless to say, our time together had an expiration date. It's just that neither of us knew what it was. We found out all too soon. During one of my off weeks, on a Saturday afternoon, to be specific, Jillian was lying on top of me after a particularly vigorous session of lovemaking when her mom called. Jillian's dad was in the hospital, fell by a stroke. His outlook wasn't promising. We had Jillian packed and at the airport as soon as we could. We hugged and kissed, and in that moment, realized that we were probably saying goodbye permanently. Jillian started crying. I just tried to hug her closer to me. When they called her plane, we separated for the final time. Her parting words were, you'll never forget you, or ever stop loving you. I maintained my composure until I got in my car, then I cried. I was alone, and it hurt terribly. I sat there and realized that my anger towards Anna, at the time of our divorce, had masked a lot of pain. Pain I had never really dealt with. Then, my single and available status had distracted me from any serious introspection. My time with Jillian had changed all of that. It cured me of my anger toward Anna and reopened my heart to love. Since it was now Sunday morning, I drove to the house. Anna and the kids realized something was wrong immediately. When I told them what had transpired, they were very sympathetic. Anna just took over. She made me breakfast, then lunch, and finally dinner. The two of us ended up talking until 1 o'clock in the morning, and then she went home. I didn't sleep well that night at all. During the week, I talked to Jillian a couple of times. Our conversations only finalized what we had both sensed at the airport. Jillian's dad was going to take a long time in recovery, and Jillian was going to stay and help her mom. I was really depressed. The kids were aware of what was going on and were incredibly supportive. Nevertheless, that Friday, I found myself very much alone. The kids were out with friends, and I had long since thrown out my little black book. Jillian had cured me of my kitty prowling ways, and I had no desire to return to them. I was contemplating dinner when the doorbell rang. Anna stood there with a pizza, a six-pack, and a comforting smile. I returned the smile, took the six-pack out of her hand, and followed the aroma of the pizza as she walked past me into the house. We had a delightful evening, chatting into the wee hours again. I was truly sorry to see her go home. Surprisingly, I slept fairly well that night. We've chosen different paths since then, never revisiting what once was. While I've forgiven Anna, the memories remain etched in my mind, a reminder of lessons learned and scars healed. Thanks for watching. What do you think about Mark's journey through betrayal and forgiveness? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more real-life stories and updates.